Welcome to Money Matters with Karen Ford, where you will learn methods and manners for increase to help you move from financial bondage to financial freedom. Hello, I'm Karen Ford and welcome to Money Matters. Today we're going to talk about money, of course, and we're going to talk about how we transform how we see and use money. Did you know that one out of every six verses in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus talked about money? In fact, two-thirds of the parables that Jesus taught all revolve about money. In fact, Jesus talked more about money than he did heaven or hell. So money must be a very important topic for God to teach us about it. So let's delve into the parable of the shrewd manager. And I'm reading out of Luke 16 verses one through eight. A rich man once had a manager to take care of his business, but he was told that his manager was wasting money. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want anybody to waste the money that I entrust them with. So the rich man called him in and said, what is this I hear about you? Tell me what you have done. You are no longer going to work for me. The manager, he was ready to fire the manager. Then the manager got a little bit worried and he said, oh no, what am I going to do? What shall I do now that my master is going to fire me? I can't dig ditches. I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do. This is what the manager is saying to himself. I know what I'll do so that people will welcome me into their homes after I've lost my job. Then one by one, he called in the people who were in debt to the master. Now listen to what he says. He told the first one, how much do you owe my master? And the guy said, a hundred barrels of olive oil. So the manager said, just write it off as 50. You're going to pay for 50, all right? Then the manager asked someone else who was in debt to his master. He said, take your bill. How much do you owe? And he said, a thousand bushels of wheat. And he said, take your bill and write out 800 bushels of wheat. The manager said, uh, 800. The managed manager, the, the master praised his dishonest manager for looking out for himself so well. And that's how it is. The people of this world look out for themselves better than the people who belong to the light. I find that very interesting. Say this word with me, if you would please say shrewdness shrewdness. Now look at Luke 16, 19 through 13. This is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, my disciples, I tell you to use wicked wealth to make friends for yourselves. Then when it's gone, you will be welcomed into eternal home. Anyone who can be trusted in little matters, he's saying money is a very little matter, can all be also be trusted in important matters. But anyone who is dishonest in little matters will be dishonest in important matters. If you cannot be trusted with the wicked wealth, he's calling money wicked wealth, who will trust you with true wealth? And if you cannot be trusted with what belongs to someone else, who will give you something that will be your own? You cannot be a slave of two masters. You will like one more than the other, or you will be loyal to one than the other. You cannot serve God and money. Say that with me. I cannot serve God and money. One more time. I cannot serve God and money. Now I find this parable, these teachings very interesting of Jesus because it's almost as if the master is praising his dishonesty, but he isn't. He's praising his shrewdness. Jesus is not praising the man's dishonesty. He's praising his shrewdness. And we can learn from anyone if we know the right questions. We don't have to agree with everything that a person does or believe, but we can still learn from them. He's telling this particular story to Pharisees. He's telling this story to Pharisees. Now, who are the Pharisees? Oh, they're the religious people of the day. However, 
They were pompous. They were prideful. They were arrogant. They were self-righteous. They were demeaning. They would, you know, they would walk through the streets of Jerusalem showing off what they were going to bring to the temple, all of their gold and their jewels and everything. They were showing the people, this is what we're bringing. They, the, but the number one characteristic of a Pharisee is that they're a hypocrite. And this is who Jesus is telling this parable to. Jesus has an, an amazing ability to comfort the afflicted while afflicting the comfortable. <laughs> and Jesus knew that the Pharisees, they had their love for money. And that's why he's telling this story to the Pharisees. Look at, six, Luke, look at Luke 16, look at, at verses 14 and 15 with me. He says, the Pharisees really loved money. So when they heard what Jesus said, they made fun of him. But Jesus told them, you are always making yourselves look good but God sees what's in your heart. The things that most people think about that are important are worthless as far as God is concerned. That's what he's telling the Pharisees. See, the things that most people think matter really don't matter. When you and I leave this earth, whether it's through death or Jesus return and he raptures us up, we're not going to take anything with us. We're not going to take any houses. We're not going to take any boats. We're not going to take any cars. We're not going to take any money. All of those things that we think are important, they really are not. Because the things that are important to God are souls. The things that are important to God is immeasurable to money. And the things that most people think are important, like possessions, popularity, power, prestige, pleasure, none of those things are really important. They don't really matter. Look at Romans 12 too. Don't be like the people of the world, but let God change the way you think. Then you will know how to do everything that is good and pleasing to Him. Wow, God has an amazing ability to allow His Word to transform us. We're transformed by the renewing of our minds. And then we can prove that which is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Jesus is telling this story to the Pharisees for two reasons. Jesus is talking to people who love money. The Pharisees absolutely loved money. And the second reason is most people maybe are poor managers. They're poor money managers. And Jesus is telling us a story here. He's saying the things that you think are important, like money, power, prestige, popularity, all of that, that's not that important. He's also saying uh, if you can't manage, if you can't be trusted with wicked riches, the riches of this world, money, then who's going to trust you with really true riches? See, true riches are people. True riches are souls. True riches are those things that Jesus is telling us about. This money, this message about the shrewdness of this terrible manager, <laughs> terrible manager is his shrewdness. Jesus doesn't praise the guy's dishonesty, but his shrewdness. So what exactly is shrewdness? Sh to, sh be, to be shrewd means you're smart, you're sharp, you're resourceful, and you're strategic. See, when we're shrewd, we can see a problem very clearly and we know what needs done, and then we figure out how to do it. What did the guy do? He told one guy, hey, how much do you owe? A hundred? Okay, write it out for 80. Oh, you owe a thousand? Okay, write it out for 500. And so he was praising the guy's shrewdness. In this story, we're going to learn four things not to do with money. Write these down. Four things that we are never to do with money. Number one, we are never, ever, ever to waste it. Look at Luke 16, 2. 
but he was told that his manager was wasting money. So the rich man called him in and said, what is this I hear about you? Tell me what you've done. You're no longer going to work for me. He was wasting money. The manager was wasting money. So if I think this is my money, I'm, I'm going to waste it. Who really cares? But see, God has entrusted us with whatever it, whatever it is we think we own. My name may be on the deed to my house, but I don't own that house. My name may be on the title to the car, but I don't own that car. My name may be on whatever it is, all the things that are in the house. I don't own it. See, we are not owners. We are managers and we are to manage the things that God has entrusted us with and we're to manage it well. However much money is in our bank account, however, however it is with our house, our cars, our boats, Whatever it is that we think we own, we really don't own. It's on loan. And God has called us to be managers of it. But knowing that it's God's, we should not waste it. Look at Haggai 1.6 in the New Living Translation. Your wages disappear as though you are putting them in pockets filled with holes. Have you ever felt like that? You get paid on payday and before you know it, it is spent. It's gone. You've paid bills. You've put gas in the car. You've gone to the grocery store and now you're waiting and anticipating the next payday. That is wages as if we have holes in our pockets. When we get paid to prevent any waste, we need to say, okay, God, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tithe, I'm going to pay my bills, put gas in my car, go to the grocery store, and I'm going to make sure I save. God has called us to be good managers of what he has entrusted us with. The second thing that we're not to do with money is that we are not to love it. Look at Luke 16, 13. You cannot... He says, you cannot be the slave of two masters. You will like one more than the other, or you will be more loyal to one than to the other. You cannot serve God and money. See, there was a Syrian God of riches. That's the spirit of mammon. And it all stems, remember Babel, the Babylonians, and they built, they were trying to build the, and remember, called Tower of Babel. They were trying to reach the heavens. They were trying to be above God. See, that's the Syrian God of riches, where you're trying to do things on your own. You're trying to do things. Uh, to You can figure it out. No, let me tell you, brothers and sisters, we can't figure it out. We're to do with the money that God has entrusted us with exactly what he wants us to do with it. We're not to waste it. We're not to love it. And the third thing that we're not to do is we're not to trust in it for our security. Luke 16, 13, you cannot be a slave of two masters. We are not to put security in anything that can be taken from us. We are to put our security, our trust in the living God. See, some may trust in uh, horses and some may trust, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. We're not to put our trust in our money. We're not to put trust in our bank accounts. We're not to put trust in our job. If we are looking at our job as our source, brothers and sisters, that's wrong. It is a resource that God will use to bless us. And God has called us to work, but he, has, he will use our paychecks as a resource. It's not our source. Our job is not our source of our income. God is the source of our income, but he will use our job as a resource to bless us. Look at Proverbs 23, 5. Your money flies away before you know it, just like an eagle suddenly taking off. Isn't it is interesting that on our, on our bills, there is a picture of an eagle. <laughs> Fly away. All right, but we're not to assume that our paycheck, our money, our eco the economy, we can't put our security in that. We have to put our security in the living God. And then the fourth thing is we are not to expect it to satisfy us. If we think having more money is going to make us happy or more satisfied, it's not. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, if you love money and wealth, you will never be satisfied with what you have. Have you been dissatisfied? Are you no longer satisfied or content with the house you live in? 
that could be a clue that we're putting our, our, our expectation or our satisfaction in things rather than God. Are we no longer satisfied or content with the vehicle that's taking, getting us to and from work? That could be a clue that maybe we're not putting our satisfaction and contentment in the living God. That's just something to note. But that's why Jesus said in, tw in Luke 12, 15, then he said to the crowd, don't be greedy. Owning a lot of things won't make your life safe. I know so many people, they just try to put themselves in a little safety uh, box a little safety balloon, whatever you want to call it, a safety bubble. They've got their house, they've got our, their cars, they've got money in the bank, but they're placing their satisfaction and their security and their trust in those things. And just like Proverbs says, your money can fly away. We can't put our trust in the money in the, money in the, in the account. We can't put our trust in the job. We can't put our trust in our house. We can't put our trust in those things. We have to put our trust in the living God who supplies. My grandma, you know, she went through the depression, but boy, gee, she just had herself in a bubble or she, it seemed to be a safety bubble, but it was not. We have to put our trust in God. So those are four things that we're not to do with money. Now here's five things that God says about money, but in we, if we act on these, our stress is going to drastically decrease. If you want your stress to, de to decrease, do these five things. The first one is we must realize that it all belongs to God. You and I did not own any of it before we were born and we don't in, own any of it now. Luke 16, 1 says, A rich man once had a manager to take care of his business, but he was told that his manager was wasting money. See, God is our master. He has entrusted us with the house, with the cars, with the money, with the job, whatever it is that he has blessed us with. We have to realize we don't own it. God owns it all. What are we doing with our time? What are we doing with our talents? What are we doing with our treasures? See, our time is not our own. It is not. We have 24 hours in a day. What are we doing with the time that God has blessed us with? Do we just say a little five minute prayer on our drive to work and then we put God on a shelf until the end of the day and then we pray two minutes before we lay down on the bed? Are we giving our time to God? What about our talents? What talents and giftings has God placed within us? Are we using them for the Lord? Are we using them according to the word of God? What about the money? What about the job? What about the house? What about the cars? What are we doing with those things? We have to realize it all belongs to God. It all belongs to God. The second thing is we must realize that God uses money to test us. Do you know that every time we get paid, we are entering a test? Sure we are. Tithing is a test. We're gonna, God's going to see where are we putting our trust? Are we honoring God with the tithe? Because what God's word says, the tithe is mine. The tithe is holy unto the Lord. See, when we place our tithe uh, online or in the offering bucket or however it is that your church does that, that's the, we're not giving to God. We're not giving the tithe to God. We are returning the tithe to God because it's not ours. God says the tithe is mine. See, the tithe is not uh, something that we sow. Uh, that, that's not an offering. The tithe is what we owe to God. God said the tithe is mine. That's 10%. You need to honor me according to Malachi 3. We're to honor God by returning the tithe to him. And God is saying, before I give you any kind of spiritual power, I got to see what you're going to do with this uh, wicked riches. 
well, I got to see what you're doing with the blessings that I'm pouring out on you. Are you going to honor me? Are you going to tithe? We must realize that it all belongs to God and that every time we get paid, we're entering a test. The third thing is God tests our, well, this is not the third thing. God tests our faithfulness. It shows what we love most. I can look at your calendar. I can look at your checkbook. I can look at your credit card if you have one, and I'm going to know where your devotion is. Yes, I can. I can see. Where are you spending all your time? Are you on the baseball field with your kids, missing church, going to play, ba watching them play baseball? Are you uh, only attending church twice a year, Easter and Christmas? Are you uh, going to church once a month, but all the other Sundays you're out on the lake in a boat? Where are we spending our time? What's going on? How faithful are we? How faithful are we with the money that God has given us? Matthew 6, 19 through 21, out of the New Living Translation, he says, don't store up treasures on earth where moth eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal because wherever your treasure is, there will your heart be also. See, our hearts are going to follow our treasure. Yeah. I've heard people say, well, I don't have a heart for missions. Start putting money in missions and then you will have a heart for missions. Wherever our treasure is, uh, wherever, our, wherever there will our heart be also. Listen, if you start investing in a stock, guess what's going to happen? You're going to start paying attention to that stock. You're going to start watching it. Why? Because your treasure's there. Our hearts follow our treasure. So if you don't have a heart for church, start putting your treasure in church. Start sowing your time in church. Start sowing your talents in church. Start sowing your treasures in church. And then your heart will follow. That's a guaranteed. God uses money to test what we really love most, and it shows who we trust or what we trust. What do we put our faith in? Or who do we put our faith in? Are we trusting our money for security, or are we trusting God for our security? Are we trusting our money for fulfillment, or are we trusting God for our fulfillment? See, Proverbs eleven twenty eight says, Trust in money and down you go. But the godly flourish like leaves in spring. See, if we will put our trust in God, that's being godly, we're going to flourish like leaves in spring, new life, flourishing, buds after buds, leaves after leaves. But if we trust in money, down we go. So if you feel like you're stagnant or not close to God, I want to encourage us, check your heart. Check your checkbook. It shows us if God can trust us. See, in Luke 16, verses 10 through 12, he's saying anyone who can be trusted in little matters can be trusted in important matters. See, money's a very little matter. Money is really not that important is what God's saying. And there's a direct connection between money and maturity. There's a direct connection between spiritual power and how we handle possessions. We have to realize that it all belongs to God. We have to realize that God is using money to test us. And thirdly, we must realize that money is a tool. These are five things that we must realize and then we're going to win with money. Third thing, money is a tool. Luke 16, 9, use wicked wealth to make friends for yourselves. See, we're to love money and use people, but sometimes what happens is we have that reversed. We love money and then we use people. But God is telling us, use temporary resources for permanent good. How do we do that? We use money to save time, we use money to save lives, and we use money to honor God. Look at the dishonest manager. Why did Jesus make him the hero of the story? He was dishonest. He praised his shrewdness. Number one, he looked ahead in verse three, he says, what shall I do now that, that my master is probably going to fire me? I can't dig ditches. 
I'm, I'm not going to beg. No, he's looking at, he's looking ahead. What can I do? And then he made a plan. How do you know if we, how do you know if you have a financial plan? Do you have a budget? There should be a budget each and every month. Now, it's granted, if you have a house payment or rent or utilities, those are probably going to stay just about the same amount each month. Utilities may vary somewhat. But what else should we budget for? Do you have to get new tires on your car? We put that in the budget. Do you have to go, are you going to a wedding and getting ready to purchase a wedding gift? That needs to be placed in the budget. We must have a budget every single month. Why? Because a budget is telling your money, what you want it to do instead of wondering where it went. People that don't know where their money went, I guarantee you, they do not budget. So what did he do? He looked ahead. He made a plan and then he acted quickly. Luke 16, 4 says, ah, I know how to ensure that I'll have plenty of friends who will give me a home when I'm fired. He not only had a plan, but he also, he acted quickly on it. And then number four, the best use of money is to use it to get people into heaven. I know that's a head tilt for a lot of people, but that's the best thing that we can do with money. We tithe because we return it to God, the 10%. And then the other thing that we do with money is we use it to win souls. Luke 16, 9, here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. We win friends. We win people by sowing into the kingdom of God. He's not saying you can buy your way into heaven. He's not saying you can purchase salvation. He's saying use your money to build relationships that are going to go on for eternity. Because he says when they welcome you. That's beautiful. And number five, one day... We are all going to give an account to God on how we used everything that God entrusted us with. Romans 14, 12 says, yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. Are we faithful with the little so that God can trust us with more? Because if we are faithful with little things, then we will be faithful in the large ones. Matthew 25, 29 says, To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this word. You're showing us how to use money. You're showing us how to see money. We know that money is a test every time we get paid. You're going to see if you can entrust us with more. I thank you, Lord, for the mind shifts, uh, the strongholds uh, being brought down in people's minds right now in the name of Jesus, and they're going to start seeing money in a different way, and they're going to start using money in a different way. In Jesus' name, amen. Join me next week on Money Matters. Thank you for joining us today. For more information about Karen or to get a copy of one of her books, make sure to visit her on the web at karenford.org. Join us next week for Money Matters with Karen Ford.